Good evening. Good evening. Yay, it's good to be in church. Amen. Thank you for those who are participating online. If you're online with us tonight, set aside everything and, and worship with us and praise God with us. Uh, hear the word, have your Bibles ready, a notebook ready. Uh, and so let's enter in together. So God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this day. That's, it's a day that you hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we just stand before you tonight in awe of who you are, of what you've done for us, of what you're going to do for us. We thank you, Jesus. So let us look into your face. Let the things of earth just grow strangely dim. Lord, as we focus on you tonight, we love you. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Good. 
There's pain within. 
broke every chain forever reign king jesus no greater name no higher name no stronger name than jesus you overcame broke every chain forever reign king jesus every giant will fall the mountains will move every chain of the past you've broken into over fear over lies we're singing the truth that now Hallelujah. There's no greater name. There's no higher name. There's no stronger name than the name of Jesus. Lord God, I thank you that you have overcome. You have broken every chain and forever you reign King Jesus. Lord, I, we look at verse 2. When, when my fears like Jericho build their walls around my soul, Lord, there's victory in the end. Your love is my battle guide. Lord, we cry out in your love tonight. Lord, no matter what stronghold we come against, no matter what battle we come against, your love, let your love be our battle cry. Let that be the anthem of all of our lives. Your love is greater than anything that we will come against, anything that we have come against, anything that we will come against. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we can fight with your love, that you have already won the victory for us. Lord, we don't fight from, for a place of victory. We fight from a place of victory. The victory is ours. You promised us that. Let us live this life in a place of victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Cameron. And everybody, here's Alex. Hallelujah. Well, you are just louder than everybody else. Good evening. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to put your finger by Joshua chapter 5 and Joshua chapter 6. And we're going to learn some lessons from Jericho. Amen? Amen? Lessons from Jericho. So we've been talking about Jericho. We've been talking about leading up to Jericho. And last week we looked at Jericho and the walls falling in Jericho. And I want to just kind of rewind a little bit to summarize Jericho. And give us some lessons from Jericho. But before I do that, let me give you a little bit of humor. <laughs> so a retiree was given a set of golf clubs. I used to golf back in the day. By his coworkers, And he thought he would try the game of golf. And so he went to the local pro and he said, give me some golf lessons. I want to learn how to play golf. And he explained that he knew nothing about golf. He just knew that you were supposed to hit a white ball. And so the pro showed him the stance and the pro showed him the swing and then said, just hit the ball towards that flag way down there on that nice flat green platform. And so the novice teed up and he smacked his first ball straight down the fairway and it landed right on the green where it stopped just inches from falling into the hole. And he says, now what? <laughs> and the speechless pro goes, well, uh, you're supposed to hit the ball into the cup. And the guy says, oh, great, now you tell me. <laughs> All right. Boo hiss. <laughs> All right, so at the Battle of Jericho, General Joshua learned some valuable lessons on the victorious life that each one of us need to learn tonight. And so remember, the ancient city of Jericho was a fortified city, and it was a frontier city, and it was a very well-built well-walled, 
tall, ancient, hard to conquer city. And a few months ago, as I was preparing for the study in Joshua, I was reading an updated archaeological article about Joshua, or about Jericho. And, and I think I've said this before, but there was an outer wall and there was an inner wall. The outer wall was about 20 feet tall and 6 feet thick. That's bigger than the walls of your house. Right, Kate? All right. Then there's an inner wall that's 30 feet tall and 12 inches thick. That's bigger than the walls of the church. <laughs> this church, anyway. Not Christ's church. And in between those two walls, so in between the outer wall, which was lower than the inner wall and thinner than the inner wall, and in between there was a 15-foot guarded walkway that you kind of walked around the city, so you were kind of inside the city but not quite inside. And those walls were so tall and so strong and so thick, on the, especially the inner walls, they built houses in them. Think about it. When you have a wall... That's 12 feet thick. You can build a house in there. Interesting. And some scholars suggested that you could also drive chariots on the top of that inner wall. I don't know how they got the horses up there. <laughs> but you could drive chariots on the inside or on the top of that wall. And so from a military standpoint, the city was virtually impenetrable. Think about that. 30 feet Walls, tall walls, 12 feet thick, 15 inch uh, way in between the inner and the outer wall, and the outer wall being 20 feet tall, 6 feet thick, very impenetrable and practically impossible to overcome. And so when you think about Jericho, think about it as a physical, think about it as a psychological, and think about it as a spiritual battle, because that's what it was to the Israelites. It was a physical battle or an obstacle, and a, a psychological obstacle, and a spiritual obstacle. And that was between where the children of Israel were standing and where God wanted them to be. It was this big physical, psychological, spiritual obstacle. And so Jericho was the first obstacle that they had to overcome if they were going to claim their inheritance of Canaan. So they couldn't go into the land of Canaan until they overcame this big physical, psychological, and spiritual obstacle. So tonight I want you to think about that Jericho is a powerful, practical picture of strongholds that are deeply entrenched and firmly rooted in many people's lives. We have strongholds. We have things that are physical, things that are psychological, things that are spiritual that we need to overcome in order to step into where God wants us to be. And they keep us from being and doing what God wants us to be and God wants us to do. So maybe it for you tonight is some recurring sin that you just keep falling into and can't seem to shake. Maybe for you it's a bad attitude that keeps holding you back. Maybe for you it's a root of bitterness that keeps you from God's work. Or maybe for, for you it's some temptation that's robbing you of your strength and keeping you from victory. Maybe it's a hurt that you can't seem to get over. Maybe it's a person that stands larger than God in your eyes, this person that you keep bucking up against. Or maybe it's an inability to really trust God and simply take him at his word. Whatever it is, whatever the stronghold is in your life, it's going to keep you from going on with God and really enjoying and experiencing what is known as that victorious Christian life that we've been talking about. And so if that's where you are this evening... I have good news for you. I love good news. Because if the, story, uh, if the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho teaches us anything, it teaches us that walls will fall. Look at that impenetrable, very solid city. They fell. And that means that obstacles can be overcome. And enemies can be defeated. And you really can live in and experience victory. Think about that. Doesn't matter what stronghold you're in tonight, physical, psychological, spiritual, the walls will fall, the obstacles can be overcome, the enemies can be defeated, and you can live in and experience victory. So with that said, let, let me look at, I want us to look at the Battle of Jericho again tonight, and I want to share, share with you some important lessons that Joshua learned from Jericho. 
that all of us need to learn tonight as well as we look at strongholds in our life. So at first, at Jericho, Joshua learned that he needed to bow to the right authority. He needed to bow to authority. And if we were to go back, we're not going to read all this because we've read it the last two weeks, but I encourage you to read uh, Joshua 5 and 6 again if you haven't. But if we go back to Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, you'll see where Joshua had this encounter with a strong soldier on the outside of Jericho. And the soldier was identified as the commander of the army of the Lord. And as I've mentioned uh, the last couple of weeks, I believe what we read about there in those verses is that this is the pre-incarnate, before Bethlehem, messianic manifestation, got that? <laughs> An appearance of Jesus Christ. Amen? Our Lord. And to put it very simple, Joshua met Jesus before his battle. He stood right before Jesus. And when Joshua met Jesus, he learned about Jesus as the person of authority. Joshua had an encounter with Jesus. Think about that. You have to have an encounter with Jesus. So what a powerful pic personal picture of salvation. And so for all of us, the first thing we have to do if we're ever going to get in on this thing called the victorious Christian life is you have to be a Christian. You have to be saved. You have to have an encounter with Jesus. You have to come and bow before Jesus. You have to acknowledge that he's absolutely supreme and admit that you're inadequate without him. You have to repent of your sin and confess to him, confess him as Savior and Lord. And so tonight I want you to think about that, all of you who are participating here or online. Have you ever done that? Has there been a time and a place in your life when you've come to this stark realization that you are a sinner and that you're headed to an eternal hell? Have you come to a point and place in your life where you admitted to God and yourself that you can't live this life and be victorious on your own? Do you remember the time when Jesus saved your soul and gave you the gift of eternal life? And some of you may say, well, I think I remember that. Or you may say, yeah, I probably remember that. Or maybe I remember that. Or maybe I'm not sure if I did that or not. Let me tell you something. When someone as, uh, when you, when someone as great and grand and glorious of, as God comes into your life, you won't have to wonder, did that really happen? You won't have to wonder if that probably happened. You won't wonder if that you're not sure that that happened. You'll know that that happened. So we have to bow to that authority. And so part of that, I'm going to give you a sub point in there. We have to bow to authority, but we have to know the position of authority. So if we go back, and we're going to read these verses in just a minute again. But go back to the title that's given to Joshua in Joshua 5.14. That this, this soldier was the commander of the army of the Lord. And that's Old Testament talk for he's the one who's always victorious. That's Old Testament talk for he's the one who walks in victory before the battle ever begins. He's the one who's in charge no matter the situation or the circumstance. So Jesus is simply reminding Joshua here that he is the one who will fight the battle. Jesus is the one who needs to fight the battles in your life tonight. Stop trying to fight them on your own. And so one of the greatest lessons that we learn from Jericho is, is that we'll never know what it means to enjoy and experience victory until and unless we come to a place where we realize that the only victories we will have will come about because of Jesus' power, not our ability. We don't get victory from, in spiritual victory with our ability. It's from Christ's power. That's why we have to fully and finally yield ourselves to his power. To say, I'm under your power in every aspect of our lives. And we have to trust Christ for the victory in the battles that we fight. And then we'll find ourselves, and those battles that we find ourselves in each and every day. And so tonight I want to ask you, are there, are there areas of your life that you have set aside and said, God, this is off limits. You can't touch this area of my life. Are there hidden parts of you that you're trying to retain control over? No, God, I'll, I'll give this part to you if when I get it all straight. But let me straighten it all out with my own strength. Then I'll hand that over to you. Jesus is Lord of all. 
Amen? Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord of all. And that means he has to have the master key to every area of your life. You can't wall off a room in your life and say, nope, Jesus can't go there. You can go here, but you can't go there. Then he's not Lord of your life. Have you done that? Have you come to a point where you acknowledge who's really in control of your life? Because until you do that, let me tell you, you might as well get used to living in defeat. Until you say, Jesus, you are Lord of all of my life, you're going to live in defeat because you'll never know what it means to be victorious. So part of bowing to authority is recognizing the position of authority, Jesus, right? And it's recognizing the principles of authority. And so when Joshua met Jesus, there was this really unusual conversation and several things, unusual things that took place. First, when Joshua saw this soldier standing there, he asked him in verse 13 of chapter 5, are you for us? Or are you for the adversaries? Are you with us or against us? Joshua was trying to play this. I don't think he was trying to play. I think he was just questioning. Are you over here, Jesus, or are you over here? And notice what his response is in verse 14. He said, no. No. So if I would say, Kate, are you for me or against me? And she replies, no. I would have to scratch my head and go, well, that doesn't answer the question. Are you for me or against me? Jesus, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he replies, no, but as the commander of the Lord, I have not come. Right? He's, not, he's saying, I'm not taking sides. Right? He said, no. And I love that because what Jesus is saying is, I didn't come to take your side. I didn't come to take their side. I came to take over. I came to take over. And there's a lesson in that for us to learn tonight. Our success and our victory will never come from our ability. It'll never come from our intellect. It will never come from our power. We've got to come to the point where we realize, like Joshua, that Jesus didn't come to take a side in our battle. He came to take over our battle. We, can't, we don't have to try to convince Jesus to fight with us or against us. He just comes to take over. We just have to step back and say, okay, it's your fight. And so here's the next thing I want you to catch. I want you to notice this odd command that the Lord gives to Joshua. Take off your shoe. Singular. Let's look it up. Chapter 5, verse 15. Then the commander of the Lord's army says to Joshua, take, off, take your sandal. Singular. He didn't say take your sandals off. Take your sandal off your foot. He didn't say take your sandals off your feet. Think about that for a minute. That seems kind of odd. For the place where you stand is holy, and Joshua did so. Why just one shoe? Kate, do you know why? Let me tell you why. In those days, back in those days, there was a custom that when two people entered a covenant, so that's what was happening here, Joshua and the Lord were entering into a covenant with each other. And one of the parties didn't have the ability or the power to keep the covenant, but the other one did. So Joshua couldn't keep the covenant, but God could. When that happened, the weaker individual would take off one of his shoes and hand it to the stronger individual. So Jesus said, Joshua, take off your sandal. You're standing on holy ground. Joshua took off his shoe, handed it out, and that was a symbolic way of saying, I can't win this battle, but you can. I can't win this battle, but you can. And so Joshua had to come to the point and place where he could openly admit that he was unable and inadequate to win this victory. But Jesus not only could, he already had won the victory. So by taking off the one shoe, handing it to the Lord, Joshua was saying, I can't win this, but you can. And furthermore, you already did win it. And so we need to learn the same lesson. We can't do it, but he can do it. And that's the problem that maybe some of you are struggling with this evening. You're trying to fight and you're trying to win your own battles on your own. You get up and you fight and you fight and you fight. And you keep taking one beating after another beating and another beating after another beating. And so what you need to do this evening is to take off your shoe spiritually, give it to God, and say, Lord, I can't fight these battles I'm facing, but you can. 
I can't gain these victories I so desperately need in my life, but you can. I can't deal with the enemies I keep encountering on my own, but you can. And so here's how to take this principle and put it into practice in your life. You've got to get to the point of complete, total, and unequivocal surrender. I surrender, God. I'm going to quit fighting on my own strength because you already won the battle for me. You've got to get to the place where all you are and all you have is lying in the dirt at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, this is your fight. I'm done. When you person and you have to person personally admit and openly acknowledge, just like Joshua, Lord Jesus, I can't do it, but you can do it. So first, we have to bow to that authority. Second, we have to walk in humility. So how did Jesus walk into hu humility? He he trusted God's promise. He trusted God's promise. So remember, in Joshua six verses one and two, just before the battle of Jericho, the Lord remained reminded Joshua of his promise of victory. Let's read verses 1 and 2 again. Now Jericho was securely shut up. The doors were locked. The big walls were sealed, right? They were securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given, past tense, you Jericho, get Jericho into your hand, its king and its mighty men of valor. He said, I already gave it to you. It's done. This is before they started marching around the city. God says, it's already yours. I've given it to you. The Lord was assuring Joshua that he had not changed his mind. He was still going to give him victory. They were promised the land of Canaan. God was going to give them the land of Canaan. And so when we face the tall walls of our strongholds today, we may be tempted to think that there's no way that we'll ever see them fall at our feet. Those walls are thick, those walls are tall, the walls of the strongholds in our life, are we can't overcome them, they will never fall. And that's when we need to remember that God has never made a promise that he doesn't keep. God never promises anything he doesn't keep. Dr. Adrian Rogers says, if God, have, if God ever failed to fulfill even the slightest, single, solitary promise, he would cease to be God. I love that. If God ever failed to fulfill even the slightest, single, solitary promise, he would cease to be God. God never changes on his word. If God says, it's done, right? And so God promised us victory. Amen? You can go ahead and mark it down big, bold, and plain that he'll provide the victory because he's promised the victory just like he said he would. So think about this truth and let it encourage your heart. God did not save you for you to spend your life as a slave locked up inside of some stronghold. God did not save you to spend your life as a slave locked up inside of some stronghold. No, he saved you for victory. That's part of his plan. Salvation. Victory. So first, part of walking into humility, Joshua had to trust God's promise. Secondly, Joshua had to follow God's plan. Let's read on, verses 3 through 5. We read this last week, but it's important. Of chapter 6. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn... And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. That's a plan, right? God is telling Joshua, you do this, you do this, you do this. So what did the Lord require of them? What did they have to physically do in order to bring down the walls of Jericho? They had to follow God's plan. They didn't have to knock the walls down. They didn't have to run in fighting. All they needed to do was follow God's plan, then stand back and the walls will fall. Right? So what was God's plan? It's simple. It's so simple it almost seems silly. Right? Seven priests w were to walk in front of the ark, bearing and blowing their trumpets, and all the rest of the people were to walk behind the ark. And the whole parade would march towards the city and around the city one time for six days. On the seventh day, everyone would get up again, go out, 
march around Jericho seven times. At the end of the seventh time marching around Jericho, the priests would blow their trumpets and all the people were to shout. Pretty simple plan. And when that happened, the walls would fall flat. Now, let me, let me help you understand. Remember, 30-foot walls on the inside, 12 feet wide, 20-foot walls on the outside, I don't remember, 6 or 8 feet wide. This is not how you conquer a fortified city in, in military standards. You don't go to a fortified city and walk around the outside blowing trumpets. That's not how you conquer a fortified city like Jericho in that day. If you were going to conquer that city, it was going to take time, a lot of time. It was going to take soldiers, lots of soldiers. It was going to take fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat, sword-to-sword -sword combat. You didn't see walls fall on a strong city like Jericho by tooting your trumpets and walking around in your sandals shouting. Just didn't happen, right? So what was God doing? What God was doing was he was removing any idea that anybody could ever have that anybody other than God himself was the one who would won the battle at Jericho. There's no way in their earthly minds could they say, yep, marching around that city, we vibrated the ground enough and the wall fell. It was us. We did it, right? So God presented Joshua with a plan that was so incredible, so audacious, so out of the ordinary, so unbelievable, that the only way to follow it was by faith in God's promise and faith in God's power. I'm sure they were going, how in the world, Joshua, is this going to win this city? How are we going to conquer this city by walking around and around and around, right? So think about this. We as believers win over our strongholds by doing nothing. That's it. We abide in Christ. We have absolutely absolute confidence in Christ and his plan and when we do that we can't do anything but be victorious we have to stop trying to figure out and fighting through things with our own strength and trust in God's plan and abide in him walking in humility following God's plan trusting God's promise number three of walking in humility is Joshua relied then on God's power the end of verse 5 of chapter 6 says this, Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. How awesome and amazing is that, right? So Israel was about to personally learn the reality of the truth that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. It wasn't their battle. And most of the things that we fight with in this life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, are not our battles. It belongs to God. And so Israel was about to be a personal participant in one of the strangest but greatest victories in history. The victory would not come by trying. It wasn't coming by their power. It came by simply trusting God and, doing, and, and trusting that God would do what he promised. So are you tired tonight of trying to live the Christian life only to find that you keep coming up short? If so, quit trying and quit failing. Instead, start trusting God and, relying on the and rely on the finished work of Christ in your life. You don't have to please anybody but God. You don't have to please anyone but God. I'm not suggesting, uh, let, me, let me tell you what I'm not saying, by the way. Here's the great thing before I get to that point. You don't have to please anybody but God, but here's the good thing. If you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you, then he's already pleased with you. Quit trying. If you're in Christ and he's in you, he's already pleased. So let me, let me tell you what you don't hear me saying. Okay? I'm not saying that you should just live any way you want, fall into every sin, just live haphazardly. That's not what I'm saying. But what I, what I am saying is this. When you have God in you and you live the way he wants you to live, you'll start to become more and more like him every day. And when that happens... You won't have to work so hard on personal holiness because it's not something you can do with your own strength anyway. We try to be holy and righteous and we try to be good. We just have to abide in him and become like him. He is our atonement. He is our advocate. He is our provision. He is our power. There's nothing left for us to do but to rely on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and then enjoy. That's why Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. The work was done. 
There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. Not by strength, not by power, not by might, but by, in the name of the Lord. By grace we're saved through faith in Christ alone. Not of works, lest any man could boast. It's all done. Jesus did all the work. Now we just have to do the walk. Walk around those cities. Walk around those strongholds. Just obey and abide in Christ. Then we can shout number three with victory. Amen? We bow to authority. We walk in humility. And we can shout with victory. We looked briefly last week at verses 6 through 21, which tells them about walking around the city. We're not going to read all those tonight. We read the details of that, this exciting story of the victory that God gave Joshua and the children of Israel at this battle of Jericho. And remember that God gave Joshua and the children of Israel very specific commands, didn't he? And they had to follow those commands if they were going to win this battle. And so the children of Israel followed every command of the Lord, and as a result, they received the fulfillment of God's promise, and they were victorious. And so the first thing they did is they proceeded with determination. They did exactly what God told them to do. Let's read verses 6 through 9 of chapter 6. It says, Then Joshua, and the, son of Nun, the son of Nun, called the priests, and he said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of God. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was... When Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came, rear guard came after the Ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. So they did just what God told them to do. God gave them instructions. They followed the instructions. They didn't put, pull out their swords and run forward to the city to fight. They just walked. Because that's what God had told them to do. And so when you do what God tells you to do, the way he tells you to do it, there will always be victory. When you do what God tells you to do, the way he tells you to do it, you always have victory. And I don't know why it's so hard for us as believers sometimes to understand and apply in our own lives and understand and apply in our own ministries. But the victorious Christian life is not new or novel means or methods. I don't have to get up in the morning and go, okay, what new method or novel idea should I come up with to apply to my life to have victory or to apply to the church to have victory? God's not changing. He's the same. It's, it, it's just a matter of simply, patiently, consistently, humbly walking with God. That's how you have victory in your life. Simply, patiently, consistently, humbly walk with God and let God do God's business God's way. We don't have to creatively try to figure out how to do God's work for him. And so catch this this evening. When, when life throws a curveball at you, just walk with God. When life doesn't make sense, just walk with God. When others throw in the towel, just walk with God. When someone a fuss and fight, guess what? Just walk with God. When you're really not sure what to do, just get up and walk with God. So winning the victory is God's job, not your job. Winning the victory is God's job. He does what he tells us, then, then we do what he tells us to do, right? When we do that, he'll give us all the grace, all the strength, and all the endurance we need to have a consistent daily walk with him. One of my favorite verses, I, I would say it is my favorite verse, is Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. It doesn't say those who get up and fight with all their might to, to do what God wants them to do with their strength has strength. No, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew. That's new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. We wait on God. He renews our strength. Number two, in shout with victory. So first we proceed with determination. Then we persevere with dedication. So think about these poor Israelites or these blessed Israelites that got to win a battle by walking. 
you can win battles in your life today by just walking with God. So they walked around Jericho one time a day for six days. Guess what happened? Nothing. They walked around Jericho six times on the seventh day. And guess what happened? Nothing. Right? Why? First of all, remember the Bible, uh, in the Bible the number six is the number of man. Six days, nothing happens. On the seventh day, they walked six times, nothing happened. I'm not going to read Revelation 13, 18. That's where it gives us the number six. It points to man's person, man's personality, man's ability, man's intellect, and man's power. Man can do everything he wants in his own power and his own ability, but he'll never win the victory. Get that. But when Joshua and the children of Israel marched around those walls on the seventh time, on the seventh day, and shouted, the Bible says that those walls fell flat to the ground. They came tumbling down. This is even better. If six is the number of man, we know that the number of seven is a number of perfection. It's a number of completion. And it's a number of God's fullness. So Israel proceeded around the city of Jericho six days, one time a day, six times on the seventh day. They proceeded with determination, and they persevered with dedication, and they kept going until they crossed over from the realm of their power into the realm of the power of God. So remember, six is the number of man, seven is the number of God, perfection, completion. And that's why when they shouted, it wasn't a shout of fear, and it, wa- it was a shout of faith, because they knew that they knew that they knew that if they obey God and walked around the city six, day, uh, six days one time, seven days on the seventh time, seven times on the seventh day, I'll get there, and shouted, they knew by faith because God promised them that those walls would fall. And that shout was a powerful pray, expression of praise because they knew that God had given them the victory even before they started that morning. Even before they started moving seven days before that, they already knew that God gave them the victory because he promised them that. And that's the essence of faith, right? Faith in Hebrews 11.1 1 says the faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So if you're battling against a stronghold tonight, faith means that you're hoping for and you don't see the evidence that you'll conquer that battle with the help of God, or God will conquer it for you. That's what faith is. Don't ever forget this lesson from Jericho. We never gain the victory over strongholds in our lives until we finally admit the victory isn't in our ability to win it anyway, but it's in, by the authority of God to give us the victory. We've got to get to that place, then we'll finally see what God can do in a life that's completely dedicated to him. You know, Jericho was to prepare for death. Jericho was to prepare for death. Look at uh, Jericho, Jericho, Joshua 6, verse 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young, old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. The people walked around the city, the priests blew, the people shouted, and the walls fell. And when they did... Joshua and the Israelites rushed up into the city and killed everything that lived, everyone that is except for Rahab and her family. Verses 22 to 23 of chapter 6. But Joshua, he said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, that's Rahab's house, and from there bring out the woman, all that she has, as you swore to her. So they promised her they would protect her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought her, brought out Rahab, brought out her father, brought out her mother, her brothers, and all that she had, and they took all of her relatives and they left them outside the camp of Israel. They didn't say, Rahab, you can stay. You and your mom and dad and your brothers and all your stuff can stay. No, they took her and left her outside. Now, some of you may be sentimental and soft-hearted and go, why would they leave her outside? She helped them. Why couldn't she stay in Jericho? Right? That's awful. Why would God tell them to take her and put her out? Why would God let them do that? Because God knew that if the inhabitants of Jericho were allowed to live, 
or the inhabitants of Jericho were allowed to stay, this will make sense in a moment, the influence of Jericho would live on as well. Think about that. And it would eventually pull uh, uh, people away from God. So that's why when the walls of this stronghold finally fell, everything and everyone inside those walls had to fall or be removed. They couldn't stay in Jericho. And so we have to get to the place where we can put out the strongholds that are in our lives. We have to take every aspect of that stronghold and get rid of it. You can't leave a shadow of the stronghold in your life. You can't leave an escape to go back to the stronghold in your life. You can't leave a taste of the stronghold in your life. You have to get them out. Because if God pulls them down for you, you've got to make sure that every trace of that fortress is completely, totally, and forever eradicated from your life. Think about that. There are some of you here participating online tonight who need to trust God to see that stronghold fall. And there are others who need to allow God to do what only God can do in your life. And then there are others who are participating or here this evening. You've seen walls fall and God win victory in your life and God only do what God can do. And what you need to do today is put it to death. Get rid of any remnant of that stronghold. Every element of that spiritual stronghold has to be removed from your life so it can't rise back up again. I see that all the time with addiction. You know what? I, I quit drinking five years ago. I got a few beers in my house. It's okay. I can handle one or two. There's a remnant of Jericho still in your life. You're going to taste that one beer one night and you're not going to be able to stop. Get rid of it. Get rid of any thing that would remind you or bring that stronghold back up in your life. As I close tonight, I'm so thankful that God gave Joshua and the children of Israel the victory at Jericho. And, and sure, the destruction of those walls was a mighty miracle all by itself, that they just fell, right? That's a miracle. But then they had to fight inside the city to win the rest of the city. And, and so overcoming the obstacle, overcoming the walls, was a sign to Israel that God would be with them going forward, right? And that he would give them the victory over any and every enemy that they would face. And so as you come up against physical strongholds in your life, as you come up against spiritual strongholds in your life, as you come up against emotional strongholds in your life, and God gives you the victory over those, know that he will give you the victory to maintain victory over those. We have to do our part. We have to bow to authority. We have to walk in humility. We have to shout to vict with victory. Amen? Let's pray. So God, we thank you for the lessons that we learned from Jericho. Lord, that, that man, when we look at a city with huge walls, in our natural mind, we would say the way to conquer that city is to run up and just tear it down. And Lord, there may be strongholds in our lives tonight. There may be things that we're battling, that we're coming up against, Lord. And in the flesh and in our hearts, we think, God, i got to fight that with all my might to make it fall down. Lord, but look what they did. They obeyed what you told them to do. And God, you've given us instructions in, in, in Scripture on how to overcome strongholds in our lives and walls in our lives. Lord, first we have to submit our lives to you. We have to be in you and you have to be in us. Lord, then we have victory. The victory is ours. There is nothing that we have to do but walk with you, just like they walked around that city. There's nothing that we have to do but walk with you. We don't have to fight with our strength. We don't have to fight with our logic. We don't have to fight with the world's logic. So many people in this world are trying to fight and come up with ideas on how to overcome things in their life when all we need to do is put it at your feet and you'll take care of that for us. We need to bow to your authority. We need to walk in humility. Lord, then you will allow us to shout with victory. So help us, Lord, to use this uh, uh, biblical example of victory by just being obedient to you. Lord, there was nothing that those Israelites could do to win that battle outside of obedience to you. Lord, and it seems foolish to us that walking around a city would make the walls fall, but they could only give you credit for that. They could only give you credit for the victory because there's nothing that they did except obey you. 
And Lord, when we come up against a stronghold in our life and we say, God, I can't fight this on my own. I can't do it with my strength. I need you to do it. And you take care of that for us. Lord, there's nothing that we can do but give you credit for that victory. There's nothing that we can do to say that, no, yep, I conquered it with my own strength. No, Lord, it's all about you. It's all about what you've done. Lord, then help us to get rid of every aspect of that stronghold. You'll help us to clean that out of our lives, just like they removed everyone from Jericho. They took them out of Jericho, Rahab, her family. There was not a remnant of the Jericho people left there, Lord, so that they could not rise back up again. And Lord, so when you help us to overcome, when you give us the victory, we are to just cast aside every aspect of that stronghold. We aren't to hold on to a thought, an idea, a door that may lead us back into it, Lord, because you freed us from it. Why would we want to carry any of it around with us again? So God, I thank you again tonight that we walk from a place of victory. We have victory in you, Jesus. We don't have to fight for it. You already fought for the battle. When you died on the cross, you said it is finished. The battle was won. So God, I thank you for won battles. I thank you for victories in our lives. Lord, I thank you that you're willing and able to help us experience victories over and over every day in our lives. Lord, we just have to submit those things to you. We have to be obedient to you. We have to abide in you. Lord, you'll take care of those things for us. Help us to stop fighting those things with our strength because we can't do it anyway. So God, I thank you for grace. I thank you that you've given us the faith to trust you. Lord, I thank you that there's nothing that we can do but just trust and abide in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
surrender to you, God. You are the one who won the victory. You are the one who gives us the victory. We surrender to you. We submit to you. We wait upon you. And we obey you. In Jesus' name, praise you, Lord.